Protests are intensifying in Iran after the country admitted to accidentally shooting down the Ukrainian jetliner in Tehran last week, killing all 176 people on board. Videos show police firing tear gas into the crowds, and some demonstrators accuse them of firing live bullets as well, although authorities deny those reports as anger in that country shifts away from the United States' killing of top general Qasem Soleimani and back towards the Iranian regime. Protesters reportedly chanting, quote, they are lying that our enemy is America, our enemy is right here. But while the Soleimani strike is taking a backseat in Iran, at least for now, in Washington, questions, of course, remain. As Defense Secretary Mark Esper seems to cast doubt on President Trump's claims that the slain military leader posed an imminent threat to American embassies. I can reveal that I believe it would have been four embassies. Well, the president didn't say it was a tangible, uh, he didn't cite a specific piece of evidence. What he said is he probably, he believed. Are you saying there wasn't been. one? I didn't see one with regard to four embassies. What I'm saying is I share the president's view that probably my expectation was they were going to go after our embassies. Probably? We'll see if that explanation holds water in the Senate later this week, where two Republicans have already said they'll support the Democrats' bill to limit Trump's authority to attack Iran or its interests. In the meantime, Donald Trump seems to be shrugging off the diplomatic route, tweeting in both English and Farsi yesterday. National Security Advisor suggested today that sanctions and protests have Iran choked off will force them to negotiate. Actually, I couldn't care less if they negotiate. will be totally up to them, but no nuclear weapons and don't kill your protests. Adding this morning, the world is watching. More importantly, the USA is watching. Of course, some of the world is taking a decidedly different approach. Leaders of the UK, France and Germany issuing a joint public statement just this morning, arguing that the best way to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons is to stand by the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Joined now by former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, who helped negotiate the Iran deal. He's now Professor of Physics at MIT, CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Secretary, it's good to see you yet good again. See you, Jim. Trump pulls out in mid-18. Iranians pull out last week after the killing of Soleimani. Where does that leave us? Where are we? Well, first of all, let's clarify what pulling out means. Uh, for the United States, that's fairly clear. We pulled out. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the Iranian case, what they did is they started every two months to announce that they would take further steps away from uh, the nuclear constraints that were placed on them. But I think it's really important first to remember, and the fifth step was the one where they said, okay, no longer any of those constraints mm -hmm. uh, apply. But let's remember the agreement, and I've said this consistently since 2015, the agreement has two pieces. One was 15 years of significant constraint on their nuclear activities. But the more important part which had no sunset, was verification. The Iranians are subject to verification by the international inspectors like no one else. And what's interesting so far, and the inspectors affirm this, that they are staying by their verification obligations. So they haven't pulled out completely in that sense. I've heard you say that in recent interviews. Yeah. Why? I, 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 if it turns out they now believe by pulling out of the first half of the two items you mentioned that they can go crazy enriching uranium, what is it? Why would they mm -hmm. allow an inspector in to see them do it? I don't get it. Uh, no, so uh, enriching uranium is, of course, an activity that's also for supplying fuel for nuclear power for mm -hmm. making making electricity uh, and they are saying we're going to go back we're going to we're going to develop our peaceful nuclear Understood. program I mean that's what they're saying yeah. uh, and the IAEA the inspectors can see everything we do and that I think it's actually quite a good move because the international community confidence in Iran not going back to a nuclear weapon program is based upon the verification. The 15 years was important so that we could build confidence, etc. But the verification is the root of our confidence. So, uh, but, so you, you think the answer to the why is because they're smart enough to know that that will likely convince other signatories and beyond that we're not doing anything other than safe uh, advancement of nuclear energy. Is that your thesis? Yeah, and, and clearly if they were to back away from that the, the verification, uh, they would probably 
or, or risk certainly losing the Europeans uh, who are still trying at least yeah, to, to restore the, the agreement. You know, uh, last time you were here, which was uh, shortly mm -hmm. after the deal was cut, it was late uh, 2015, I believe you said that when I asked you how close were they to developing nuclear material needed for weapon, you said just a few months, maybe three. How far are they today? Um, farther than that, because for one thing, uh, as a reminder, uh, all of the 20% enriched uranium uh, is out of the country. Uh, there more than 10 tons of enriched uranium is out of the country. Pursuant to the deal. Pursuant to the deal. Now, clearly, uh, and with the deal, we always said that there was a minimum, even if they went all out, didn't try to hide anything, it would take them at least a year uh, to get to a first bomb. Uh, now, that's clearly been eroded uh, somewhat, and it will erode as time goes on. Frankly, uh, it would be terrific if we could find uh, a way uh, back to the table to build off of the foundation of the agreement and start addressing uh, as well the other regional issues. You spend most of your uh, time in the world of fact. I spend a lot of mine in the world of the hypothetical, so if you'll mm -hmm. bear with me. Why did Trump pull out of this deal? Well, I, Is it as I, simple as the fact that your boss was responsible? Well, obviously, obviously, many many say that. I don't know. Uh, it is the case. Uh, we can't hide the fact that when we reached the agreement, uh, it wasn't exa exactly that there was uniform, uh, you know, uh, praise. Uh, it was pretty much split, unfortunately, along a partisan partisan lines. However, I believe that the main reasons uh, that were uh, given to oppose the agreement and may have been part of the president's thinking uh, are, are, are specious, quite, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the, uh, I, I may have used at that time another analogy, which was that uh, in the Cold War, Ronald Reagan was faced with multiple problems with the Soviet Union. Didn't stop him from negotiating on nuclear weapons and arms control. And, this, and the philosophy here was the same. Get the nuclear weapon risk off the table don't let up the pressure on addressing Hezbollah and Syria and Yemen and Iraq uh, and human rights and missiles, uh, but build from the, the solid foundation that we don't have to worry about nuclear escalation. Is it possible, this is another hypothetical which you probably ignore as well, is it possible Donald Trump has no idea what he's talking about? I mean, it, it's, I think we, most people believe, except his, uh, the most trumped up people in his orbit, that this is foreign policy by impulse, the killing of Soleimani as an example. When you listen to the arguments about sunset provisions, which you've already responded to, so I didn't even deal with it, his mm -hmm. a statement, in, uh, part of his statement the other day, talking about how we paid, uh, the United States paid for those missiles, about the money that the United States gave to Iran, when obviously he was just freeing up frozen funds. Is it possible that he just has no idea what is really in this, and it's just a rhetorical mm -hmm. uh, uh, flourish on the part of the president? You're absolutely right that I do not deal in speculation. But, <laughs> but you think facts. that, don't you? <laughs> I have no comment. Is it possible that his maximum <laughs> right. pressure approach here with additional sanctions might work, even though it wouldn't be your chosen route, you would have stayed in the deal? Is it possible that getting out of the deal uh, showing force, as we did a week ago, I think it was Friday, uh, upping the sanctions. Is it possible that he's right, that this will force Iran back to the table for what he would consider to be a tighter deal? Well, it's not ruled out, but uh, I think the odds are against it, uh, for sure. I certainly think that there was a much cleaner path uh, towards what he wanted Which by staying in the deal. Staying in the deal uh, and negotiating. Uh, the, it was always clear that the, options, the option was there to negotiate on those regional uh, challenges, which are enormous. It's also clear, by the way, that if we did not succeed in that, we were still ahead by getting the nuclear weapon off the table. And, and I have to say, it's not just nuclear weapon in Iran, but there's the concern that not only, even if they don't develop a weapon, but we're not sure, and their neighbors are not sure, there's also a big risk of a proliferation in that, in that part of the world, and that would not be a very pretty scene. As I think we know, uh, Donald Trump is not a huge fan of diplomacy, and you and John Kerry and others engaged in some serious diplomacy, spent scores of hours with the Iranian representatives. What do you know about them that Donald Trump doesn't that would be useful to him and his people? Well, I think one thing is that uh, when you build relationships you find ways of addressing problems. I'll mention one. 
Secretary Kerry, John Kerry, when we had our sailors mm -hmm. uh, taken into custody. That got resolved quickly. It got resolved because he had a relationship with his counterpart uh, and, and could work the problem. Uh, similarly, uh, what, what I certainly learned in the negotiation was uh, that despite all the rhetoric and obviously the very poor relations, uh, especially since 1979, mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of respect for what we in the United States do and know how to do. Uh, there's a great, certainly on the science and technology side, tremendous desire to work with us, to collaborate with us. We can't do that without resolving the political issues, but those, those relationships just allow us to solve problems, and they've pretty much been shattered. Can we uh, end with moving from Tehran to right here back to Massachusetts? I know you're uh, an advocate of nuclear energy, and obviously that's going much more center stage with the concerns about climate change, at least concerns about climate change outside the White House. What do you say to people who have concerns uh, as evidenced by what happened with the, with the plant that was shut down in Plymouth, where the license was transferred to a company that has absolutely no experience, has never decommissioned a plant, uh, has, has not guaranteed that we'll have the money available to do it, is proposing to do it in a time frame that is almost like lightning, which is not done before. And virtually every leader in the state, elected leader, is opposed to the plan, has gone to the regulatory commission and others and gotten nothing. What do you say to those people? Why should they have confidence in both the safety of a nuclear plant when open and the safety of the decommissioning of a nuclear plant once it's closed. Well, let me start by saying what I really advocate for is getting to low carbon. Mm -hmm. And nuclear power is, uh, has been, uh, it's a fact, it has been our largest uh, zero carbon Understood. source. And that's why I so, mentioned climate and, change. And that's why the climate change, yeah. and that's why, that's why it's important. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of concern on the climate side that we've seen the shutdown now of quite a few plants and, and more and more coming. Now, well, only a few at 30 yeah. What do you say to the people in Plymouth? So your question on the, on the safety uh, is that, uh, first of all, at least in the, United, in the United States, we have never had an accident that caused significant harm to the public. Uh, Three Mile Island, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some equity owners uh, mm. were hit, but uh, there was not a public health issue. Uh, new, the new technologies coming uh, even better uh, in terms of in terms of safety, uh, but we have problems to 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 resolve. And one of the things that the people of Plymouth are going to be now faced with as well is uh, trying to move that irradiated fuel uh, out because obviously nationally we have not succeeded uh, in in doing that. Moved yet. by a company that's never done it before. Um, well, if we can move the fuel out, I think that will be done by a company who's done it before. Okay. Uh, but uh, the decommissioning is also a, seri a serious issue, um, and there the the regulators have to have to play a very, very strong role. Secretary, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks again. so much for your time. Thank Secretary you. Ernest Moniz.